Hello whiskey fans, today I'm going to be looking at something which is and always has been a little bit of a supermarket staple and this is one that I can remember from the early days of when I was first getting really interested in whiskey, sort of mid to early 2000s. So a little bit of history about what I started with in whiskey. Ardmore was a whiskey that was always there but it didn't necessarily look like this. I think it was always seen by me and the people that I used to drink with back then as slightly premium, a little bit above the, the run of the mill whiskies, but not in the excessively expensive bracket. But it was always a repeatable and dependable level of decent quality. And another thing that always helped is that it was always on a good offer as well. You could get a bottle of the Ardmore traditional cask for around not much more than £20. Saying that, I do have to admit that the Ardmore traditional cask was one that I never really showed that much love to. It was definitely a good quality whiskey and it had that little bit of peat to make it a little bit interesting, a little bit of maltiness, a little bit of spice, a little bit of flavour. And the original Ardmore traditional cask, it was one of the first whiskies that I was really experienced to that's bottled at a full 46% ABV. And back then, sort of 15-20 years ago, if you're looking at whiskies in the supermarket that are bottled at proper drinking strength of 46 or thereabouts, you were really looking at Ardmore or Talisker, and that was probably about it. Another thing that I really liked about Ardmore is that I think that they were the first distillery that I was ever exposed to that really pushed non-chill filtered as a real selling point, something that is really the gold standard of production, that a lot of distilleries are obviously jumping on the bandwagon now and everyone is shouting and screaming for non-chill filtered 46%. But Ardmore did seem to be quite ahead of the curve, promoting that craft presentation 15-20 years ago. But as with everything in life and whiskey, you don't always know what you've got until it's gone, and nothing lasts forever. So the old style Ardmore traditional cask, which was in that kind of reddish brown tube with a, a sky landscape at the top and the eagles on it much darker color scheme than this it was replaced by this Ardmore legacy so the question is is it any good so as i briefly mentioned before the old Ardmore traditional cask it was bottled at a full 46 percent abv and it was non-chill filtered so let's take a quick look around the label of this Ardmore legacy see what we've got now so colour of that we haven't got an age statement on this and I don't think they ever published an age statement on the Ardmore traditional cask either so caught it by evens there so the first thing that I'm going to balk out on this one is that it is reduced all the way to 40% ABV it's also and this is really baffling I absolutely couldn't believe this when I first saw this Ardmore legacy appear in the shops they've changed to chill filtration in this day and age, when you've got all the whiskey distilleries climbing over each other to rush to natural colour and non-chill filtered, trying to convince us, the whiskey connoisseurs, that their whiskey is a craft presentation, that they really care about flavour and the experience and pushing a quality product. Ardmore, who were one of the early champions of non-chill filtration and 46%, have gone from 46% down to 40% and have started to chill filter the product. And I really struggle to understand why they've done this, but I've read and reread the label multiple times and they have indeed changed over to chill filtration. As for the colour, again we don't know if there's, again we don't know the age of this whisky. But from the colour of that and the clarity, that definitely looks like a very heavily chill filtered whisky, the colour of the, the actual clarity of that. But the colour of it, I would say that that looks like it's had not a huge amount, but quite a bit of caramel added in. And if we look on the back of the tube, it does actually confirm that. It does say in the bottom, not in English, because they're not legally obliged to tell us in the English speaking world, but in various European countries, they are obliged to say if they've artificially polluted the whiskey with colouring, and that's exactly what that means right there. But I have looked around and I can't actually see that the, the original Ardmore traditional cask was any different. I think it probably was always a coloured whiskey. But the, the general picture that I'm getting here is that. I'm kind of struggling to see what their market position is, who they're actually trying to sell this whiskey to. 
you've got this whiskey with eagles on the bottle and a map of the distillery telling you that it's a light and sweet with unique highland peat smoke notes distilled and bottled in Scotland since 1898 really trying to push you that this is a quality premium product worth paying extra money for and then they drop the ABV right down and chill filter it it's all a little bit confusing seems like a little bit of an odd and precarious market position to be selling a premium top shelf scotch without any shred of the craft presentation so carry on with the label see what else we've got 700 milliliters Traditionally handcrafted in the Scottish Highlands, the Ardmore Distillery has been watched over by a family of rare eagles since 1898. Do eagles know how to make whiskey? One last detail from the tube, the distillery is actually situated in Kennethmont, Aberdeenshire, which I believe is just east of the region that you need to be in to call your whiskey a Speyside. I do feel that the style of Ardmore, if they had the option of classing their whiskey as a space side they'd probably choose to go with the highland label so let's get some in the glass and see what it's like so 40 percent chill filtered ardmore legacy here we go it's actually something about this one that reminds me a little bit of bowmore and it's not so much well, there's, there's a little bit of similarity there in the fact that it's a lightly peated whiskey, but it's more the fact that this whiskey is so middle of the road. There's a little bit of peatiness, there's a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of maltiness, a little bit of age, but not too much of any of them. It really does seem like a whiskey that is almost afraid of being any one thing. There is definitely some peat to this though, at least on the nose. And I must say, it's actually quite a nice peatiness. It's a rather damp, peaty, damp grist note. A little bit of caramel, a little bit of wood spice. Rather nice caramelly malt aroma on the nose. Some nice cereally gristiness. Actually works well that you've got some really nice toasted oak notes in there. Now I do wonder if that's coming over from some quarter casks, because a big thing about the old Ardmore traditional cask is that another of their selling points was that they matured the whiskey in quarter casks, which I think they were one of the, the earlier distilleries to do that, to add a little bit of maturity and a little bit of wood influence in a bit less time. Now I do notice that in this Ardmore legacy, there is no longer any reference to quarter casks, so I don't know if they're continuing to do that or not, but that toasted oak wood spice note makes me think that they possibly are, but maybe not to the extent that they were. Getting some rather nice but faint fruity lemon lime notes, and a little bit of an acrid antiseptic bandages note, but again, definitely not a peat bomb, but there's, it's a pleasant, but light peat influence on the nose of this one. I hate to say it, I really hate to say it, but I think the best way to describe the nose of this whiskey is easy, easy drinking, easy nosing. It's an easy, inoffensive whiskey. And there's no more damning or spiteful way to describe a whiskey than inoffensive, is there? Let's see how it tastes. So the first thing that you get on the palate of this one is more of that damp, peaty gristiness. It's actually a little bit Laphroaig-y in that, you know how in a lot of the younger Laphroaigs, you get a mix of some sweet vanilla and some really damp, dirty, not necessarily smoky or ashy, but a really damp, gristy peatiness. And you're getting a little bit of that in this one, but it's really a Laphroaig light really a Laphroaig very light. It's going to have a little bit more. There's definitely a rather strong, not immature but youthful maltiness to this one. Rather a caramel malt note with more of that sweet lemon and lime character that I had on the nose. And that maltiness, one thing that I will say works really well on this one, is that the, the maltiness, sort of those toasted cereal notes go really well with that toasted oak wood spice character 
But on the other hand, and to the detriment of this whiskey, I do have to say that the peat does seem a little bit forced, seems a little bit shoehorned in, a little bit of an afterthought. And the palette on this one, and especially the late palette, is very watery. It's really lacking in body on the palette, and it really dies off quite drastically towards the end of the palette and the finish. And I think this is really, it's one of those whiskies where it smells quite nice, and then you get around to tasting it and you realise that it's quite underpowered. And in that sense, I think it's really defined by what's not there a lot of the time more than what is, and that's a bit of a shame. So the whole progression on this one is something that I often see in your 40% whiskies, And I think this could be quite a lot better if it was still bottled at the 46% ABV. But my problem with this whiskey is, it smells quite nice, the early palette is quite nice, and then it gets slowly worse, and it just... The late palette is more disappointing than the early palette, and the finish is just quite watery, quite mild. It's, a little, it's got a little bit of wood spice lingering on the late finish, and I think if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be much there at all, because the finish is quite weak and quite simple. So... All in all, the grade I'm going to give this one is going to be a C-. minus. So in my marking scheme, that's the lower end of good. So it's not it's not a disappointing whiskey if you hadn't paid for it. <laughs> if it was a gift, then fantastic. But unless you get it on offer, I don't think that it's worth the money, sadly. I'd say it's good, it's pleasant, but it's mild. And I think if you can get this on offer in the low 20s, 20s of pounds, then I'd say that the price probably matches quite well with the price point. The main problem I've got with this whiskey is the ABV. I think that by lowering the ABV, they've really killed a lot of the flavour. And me personally, I'm all for moderate and safe or safer drinking, everything in moderation. But with this whiskey at 40%, I do find that I'm having to take larger sips, almost gulps, to get the same amount of flavour that I would if this was bottled at a full 46%, and that's absolutely not what I want. You might find that a lot of the reason why they've dropped the ABV on this one is the same reason why a lot of distilleries drop the ABV, and it's the same with beer as well. It's the reason why a lot of beer tends to be on the low side in terms of strength until you get up into those premium beers. It's tax. It's not just that they want to make their alcohol stretch further, although of course they do like that, but the way that the UK government at least, and to a lesser extent it's the same situation in America, the way that the governments tax these things, it's a set amount of money to pay per unit of pure alcohol. So if you sell one litre of 100% ABV alcohol, you pay the exact duty rate for that. If you make the bottle smaller, or if you make the contents weaker, you're selling less pure alcohol, so you pay a lower rate of flat rate duty. And that's something I have a serious issue with, because by doing that, the government will tell you all day long that they're doing it for your interest, for everyone's interest, because they're getting all of us to drink less of these harmful, horrible, horrible, poisonous chemicals that we all insist on drinking, that the government insists on selling that the government insists on allowing these companies to sell, I don't know why. But when I'm drinking this, and I find myself taking a, a slightly larger sip than average, it just makes me wonder, has the entire system gone a little bit crazy? I'm just sure that it's not what the government and HMR, well it probably is what HMRC want, but it's not what the government and the chief medical officer of the UK, and it's not what I personally want, to be taking larger sips and getting closer to drunk, just to get the flavour experience that I want. Anyway, I'm going to step down from my soapbox now and call it a day on this review. And next time, we'll be looking at something else. Cheers.